Good morning. How did I do with my mic? Is the age of technology <laughs> alive and well? Good. I take for my text today uh, this verse from the opening chapter of Genesis. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Here is nature in its perfection, a fruitful, animated, and lush realm, an earth pouring forth creatures of every kind, wild and tame, and the face of the ground covered with life. Here is the natural world of the smallest of crawling things, the furtive field mouse and chameleon, the insects and spiders and lizards of all sorts, the seas already teeming with creatures, great and small, that will roam the paths of the sea, and the air alive with wings. We are offered in these short verses a glimpse of a world that vibrates with life. It is hard in our world to imagine life on this scale, an untrammeled and unrestricted ocean of life in its many forms, dense and active and swarming with the exuberance of a creation newly made. In urban life, and now sadly even in rural and wild places, Animals and birds are scarce. We notice and comment on the sighting of a fox or a bear. We are startled by watching deer, perhaps an adult or two, and some fawns stand as they stand quietly at the edge of the woods and flick their long ears at us. Large birds are counted by single numbers. An eagle, a woodpecker or two circling the trunk of a tree, a kingfisher waving on a reed over a stream bed. Of course, we have read of lusher times, the seas that roiled with lobster and cod when the English set ashore at Plymouth the skies that darkened when flocks of passenger pigeons arced across the domes of the heavens, the buffalo herds or rhinoceros or elephant tribes shaking the earth as they pass, all familiar stories of a nature still overbrimming with life. Extinction of living things in our world is a solemn fact we have all encountered, at times with resignation, even perhaps some defensiveness, and at times with great sadness and guilt. But we no longer need anyone to tell us in North America that nature does not bring forth living creatures in the abundance it once did under the good God's lavish hand. We see that truth every day. Of course, this dis diminishment of living creatures on the earth has been developing over many years, perhaps centuries. My own speculation is that the young Charles Darwin, when he set sail on HMS Beagle, saw the last of the untrammeled natural vitality of Earth. His stunning description of animals and birds in the Galapagos, their very great numbers, their spectacular plumage and carapace and claw, 
their astonishing boldness in approaching human beings without fear and with an air of welcome. These descriptions can only fill us with poignancy, a portrait of a world now vanished from our sight. It seems to me that when we Christians hear the stirring verses from Genesis that ornament the beginning of Holy Scripture, we might be struck and convicted by this first unmistakable note that the earth poured forth living creatures, an ocean of life, and in the Lord's eyes it was good. Consider, too, that remarkable suggestion in the opening verse that the earth brought forth living creatures, a depiction easy for us to pass by unnoticed. It seems to me that the inspired writers were here drawing our attention to the great humility of our God the welcome that the Lord God bestows upon creatures. Let there be. This command is carried out by a word, or in our verses, by another creature, the dry ground itself. Scripture is careful to demarcate the very great dignity of the human creature, that as Basil the Great says, we are fashioned out of mud, yes, but mud that is shaped by the very hand of God. Not so do the other living creatures emerge from nothingness and take their place on Earth's stage. Rather, they spring forth indirectly, anonymously, as it were, generated by the creatures and created forces spoken into being by the Creator. It is true, Basil and Blaise Pascal tell us, that we are creatures fashioned from the dust, mere broken reeds. But the animals created on this original day belong to the earth in a singular way. Animals and creeping things emerge from the earth they are the ancestors of dust. Now we might ask ourselves here what Holy Writ might seek to tell us in this remarkable phrase from Genesis. Now it was medieval and early modern theory that certain larval forms emerged directly from the earth or perhaps from decayed matter within it. The worms and beetles that inhabit and digest decaying corpses, think of Dermestes, for example, were thought to originate immediately from the dead animals already returning to the dust. But early naturalists from the 17th century exploded that theory. They covered the decaying flesh with netting preventing the insects from laying their eggs there. So, no creeping things emerged from the earthy flesh. It seems, then, that Holy Scripture should not be read to teach that the living creatures emerged like larval forms from decaying ground. Notice here that I am suggesting a pattern not strong enough or rigorous enough to be called a rule, a pattern that the relation of the natural sciences to the Bible is a limit concept. We do not consider the Bible wrong or discredited by the natural scientists here, nor do we see instead what is to be exegeted and taught. We have rather a constraint on the form of reading we are permitted in our exegesis of this text. This verse from Genesis does not teach the immediate generation of animals or insects from decaying earth. 
Now, I want to say quickly here that to be sure there are those who consider the authority of Scripture to be properly honored only if there are no constraints or limits whatsoever in our internal reading of Holy Writ. Martin Luther appeared to hold this view, or was someone as prolific and voluble as Luther, I should say, held at times such a view. And he considered the persistent rumor emerging from naturalistic circles that the earth circled the sun, patently false, as Holy Scripture spoke plainly of the sun rising and setting and standing still at noonday on the plains of Gibeon. But not so did Cardinal Bellarmine read the Holy Scriptures, nor Galileo for that matter, nor many later Reformed and Lutheran divines. For these exegetes, the discoveries in the planetary and sublunar realms determined only what pertained to those fields, the movements of planets in their courses, the patterns and laws of natural process, and only could limit the natural or metaphysical assumptions applied to the scriptural text. These early Christian divines, that is, assumed that Holy Scripture could not teach what was false, as Luther did too. But they held also that the natural scientists could discover truth. And those naturalistic disclosures must be honored in an indirect way in the explication of Holy Scripture. The book of Genesis tells us about the natural world, the cosmos we are graced to inhabit. But it does so in its own idiom and at its own lofty preserve. It does not teach or compel us to teach elements of the world we know on other grounds to be false. Or so I say. I don't pretend to have said here all that needs to be said about scriptural authority, about meaning and referent, and about technical notions such as limit concept or a unitary conception of truth. But I hope perhaps this may be enough to allow us to see how we might advance our thinking on scripture and technology while honoring the truths of both. So we can affirm that animals and not decaying ground bring forth living creatures, animals wild and tame, and creeping things of every sort. This too is in concert with the teaching of Genesis. We are not being asked, I say, to imagine these animals in some larval state buried in the ground and emerging on command. That alone would seem to undermine the notion of reproduction defended so richly in other sections of the creation narrative. But what are we to say instead? I am not thinking here first about my larger methodological point I made above, the levels of explanation, their relation, and the distinct domains of their vocabulary and referent. Rather, I want to turn here to positive proclamation. What does Genesis teach us about the living creatures of our earth? It seems to me that at least one of the rich truths we are offered here in Genesis is that living creatures belong to nature, to the organic and earthy in a way distinct and immediate and ineradicable to them. True, the first Adam was of the earth, earthy, as the apostle tells us. But the ground does not bring forth humankind. God does that after his own image and likeness. Non-human animals, I'll say more about that phrase in a moment, they belong to the earth. They are part of it, 
and they are natural in a way we can only admire. They are organic, true, and carbon-based, also true, but most truly they are natural. They are fully creatures of this good earth. Animals of every kind live in the earth, are its inhabitants in an unrestrained and total manner. They burrow down into it or make dens of its hollows and caves. They climb up into tree branches or lie down under the bark safe within. They reproduce according to cycles that belong to the natural realm circadian and lunar and solar, each according to its kind. And they occupy the hours of daylight, foraging for food from the earth and defending their young from predation. These very common sense observations, the most ordinary kind of natural observation, make animals in truth utterly remote an alien to us. What is it like to be an animal or creeping thing or a bat in Thomas Nagel's famous phrase? What it is like is unimaginable to us. And this is Nagel's point too. But even more so because of their utter purity, their complete naturalness. They live not by calendar, perhaps not even by time, but by season and by sun. And their aims belong to the organic realm of danger and feast and clan. In all these ways, the creatures of the earth are the creator's special congregation, his pure gift of the natural in his cosmos. To harm these splendid gifts, to dismiss or denigrate them, to remove the earth from their paths and habits and ways is to sin against this great gift, to despise the lavish world poured forth from the Creator's hand. Now you will note here that I have not divided the terrestrial animals into wild and tame or domesticated. Holy Writ has not given them separate days of creation. And I think we have reason to listen especially attentively here. The kinship between non-human animals and human beings belongs to the oldest strata of life on earth. It belongs even to the days of creation, a promised gift even before our kind was made. Indeed, the word often translated cattle in our versions also means more broadly animal, especially a tamed or domesticated kind. When we say the word cattle, we are catching up the whole realm of living beasts that have become human companions. They are central to human life. We humans could not survive without these special animals. The draft horse and oxen patiently bending their neck to the yoke. The chicken and the goose giving food of many kinds. Sheep and goats, their herds and flocks the oldest form of wealth of our kind, the companionship of dogs, the milk and flesh of cattle, all these are life itself for our ancestors. The patriarchal narratives in Genesis disclose to us a world built up by that partnership. The natural animal become human companion. Just this, in the matchless concreteness of Holy Scripture is the quiet war between Jacob, the man of the pasture, and Esau, the man of the wild hills and game. Or earlier still, of Cain's sacrifice of fruits of the earth, 
scorned while Abel's of the pasture is not. Of that distinction, the first murder is born. Holy Scripture underscores in all these ways the primacy of those living creatures to the human story, to human flourishing, to our conflicts and cruelties, and our very survival in a world that now brings forth thorns and thistles. Domestic animals, then, are these natural creatures brought into our orbit, drawn into human realm and ways. They remain natural creatures. It does not take Jack London to tell us that. But they have in some way turned toward us, lifted their faces from out of the wilderness, and turned them toward the human house and field. They have cast their lot with us, at great peril often, and at great cost. It was one of Karl Barth's central insights in the doctrine of creation that creation and covenant are linked together, not one preceding the other or remote to it, but joined in their innermost realities, such that in Barth's words, the covenant is the internal basis of creation and creation the external basis of the covenant. The tame animal, also brought forth from the good earth, is a sign, we might say, of the covenant, deep within the narrative of creation. Indeed, the Hebrew term we translate bring forth can also mean leave-taking, exodus. Already the liberation from slavery sings in these first verses of scripture. These creatures, we might say in a more Lutheran tone, are notes of promise within the days of creation. That we, the stewards, but also the despoilers of this good earth, will not be left alone, will not be abandoned, but will rather be helped. Now, not every moral and social matter can be addressed in one lecture, uh, even a very full one such as this. But I do believe that Holy Scripture does instruct us about the special dignity and divine graciousness of the tame animals in our midst. I do not or do not yet believe that this special dignity demands that I return to eating only plants. But I do think that our treatment of animals given over to our care in our homes, but also in our feedlots and slaughterhouses, our barns and coops and stables, in all places where these good creatures of the earth have thrown in their lot with us, should be places of protection, of dignity and respect, without expediency or indifference, or most especially without cruelty. These animals mark the transition in the natural order to the world of the human. May it also for them be the world of the humane. The significance of all cattle, that is, of all domesticated animals, can be marked in a second way by their inhabiting a realm at once natural and human. They are hybrid beings caught between the utterly organic and earthy and the cultural realm of the human species. We might say that they bring out with particular clarity the complex scope of the sixth day of creation. Attentive readers of the Genesis account will know that animals of all sorts and creeping things are created on the same day as is the human being. Despite what many critics think, 
Holy Scripture does not reserve a special day of creation for our kind. Not at all. In fact, we human beings find our place on this earth with all other living things brought forth from the dry ground. And in closest kinship to these tame animals who will make life fit for us. Domestic animals bring us to the threshold of the central determining concept for the human, the realm of the cultural or artificial. It is so strongly a commonplace of the humanities that we humans are through and through suffused with the cultural and the built that we do not often pause to consider its effect on our doctrine of creation and our life as those made in the image and likeness of God. But we learn from the sixth day of creation that those living creatures who emerge from the ground, the holy natural beings, leave something of this realm behind when they enter into our sphere. Already in our originary day, we humans inhabit a sphere that transforms everything it touches, from the animals who surround us to the lands we will occupy east of Eden. This realm, too, is hybrid. We humans belong to our animal kin. We are creatures of the same day. As old as Aristotle is the notion that we humans are kinds of animals, rational ones, homo sapiens, and belong in some fashion to the organic and self-moving realities Aristotle considered the natural kinds of the earth. Human beings had animal bodies, Aristotle thought. Our souls or animating elements shaped shared in the largest animal capacities of intentionality and goal, of self-movement and reproduction, of the generation of heat and the task of digestion, the risk of injury, and the solemn conclusion in death. Genesis, too, considers us human animals in just this way. We, too, are living creatures from the ground, as Genesis 2 plainly shows us. We, too, find a form of companionship with other non-human animals, as Genesis 2 tells us again quite directly. And we, too, find that our little lives are rounded by a sleep. But Genesis does not stop there any more than did Aristotle or Plato. The human being has a power of rationality, of self-knowledge and determination that seems to set us apart from our natural kin and transform even those animals that come close to our environment. The sixth day speaks of this distinction as an icon or image a Hebrew term that already embeds menace within it, a threat of idolatry and false image, all too quickly realized in the history of our kind. This is the realm of the cultural and the artificial, that which is made, not born, and it lies close to our very definition, to the glory of human creatures and also to our shame. We inhabit this hybrid realm uneasily. Consider, for example, how uneasy we are in our scientific accounts of the world about the place and stature of the human being. Among some philosophers of science, this anxiety is expressed in a large geometric analysis. Does the animal kingdom have a rupture or break within it? Or is the line of animal forms uninterrupted, continuous, seamless? 
Now, I think this question is dazzlingly difficult to answer. In truth, I think there may be a strong self-referential dilemma in this very framework. What kind of animal, after all, asks this sort of question? Is it possible to answer this question with a deflationary response that we are little more than wetware, as some philosophers put this in a telling phrase, or clever animals, to use Karl Rahner's phrase, and not in this way affirm our odd and unique character by our very ability to give ourselves away? We might consider even as a sketchy shorthand the significance of language here. What does it mean that some of the living creatures fashioned on the sixth day have acquired an elaborate and highly sensitive faculty of speech and of writing? As is well known, present day philosophers have taken what is sometimes called the linguistic turn in the understanding of humankind. Our inwardness is itself a creation, they say, of the very language we speak and hear from our birth forward. Think of King David and his matchless expression of grief for his son Absalom. Language has given the king the inwardness of loss and tragic sorrow. Would that I had died for you, Absalom, my son, my son. So striking is this vast landscape of the inward that we might ask, has language broken open a seam in the natural realm? Is this the origin of the new need the artificial and the cultural that has transformed the face of the earth? Does it make us and our kind unique or more modestly distinctive? This is a serious challenge, I believe, for any reductionist account of the philosophy of mind or for the study of human neurobiology. But there are other more objective and less self-referential worries to occupy us as well. Take, for example, the very notion of an emergent property, a characteristic or power that emerges from some lower level, some organic and biological stratum, and bestows a higher causal power or faculty on a being. This notion is the philosopher's stone that secular neurobiologists and biologists seek. Perhaps emergentism, or perhaps a rival evolutionary account, will fully assimilate human beings to the natural animals and kinds that now populate the globe. My own belief is that Genesis has already shown us a deeper, and more sophisticated and more plausible schema for relating human beings to other non-human animals. We belong to the same day of creation, and some animals in a special way belong to us and our sphere, and that we belong to God in a way that only the Lord's generous grace could envision, that we could resemble and bear forth his very image, his likeness. So you'll notice here that I have inverted my limit concept, its negative scientific character with a positive teaching in which Holy Scripture is allowed to speak in its own authority and voice. This gift of imaging is an intensification of living natural life forms in such a way that something radically new, the human creature as culture bearer, has come forth from other animals 
and the small creatures on earth. We have become the living creature, both natural and artificial, that through the grace and calling of Almighty God occupies a singular place in the economy of our planet. I am suggesting here that the Imago Dei may be characterized as an intense inwardness, an elixir of grace that brings the human animal into the house of language and opens our kind to the task and plans, the responsibility and guilt, the exquisite sensitivity of self-expression and of self-giving, in short, to the realm of culture that only our kind inhabits. Students of neurobiology and the philosophy of mind will notice that I am now making a claim for human distinctiveness on the basis of consciousness and self-consciousness. I do not believe, that is, that King David's anguished cry of grief will ever be reduced to brain states or neural firings, however vital these animal events are for the human mind. His inner torment and sense of guilt will never be wholly naturalized. Now, it might be possible to consider inwardness in this strong sense a kind of property. We human beings have picked up an additional property to those held by all other animals, domestic and wild. And to be sure, a power or disposition of this kind can be assimilated to the notion of property. Human beings have the characteristic of inward deliberation and self-knowledge. But here I believe Genesis is of additional help to us. The distinctive decision in Genesis 1 to make human beings in the Lord's own image, an image I am suggesting that is the gift of intensive inwardness, makes an ontological difference. Human beings have acquired more than a distinctive property or power. They have become a unique life form, a culture bearer. The imago Dei that each of us is, even in our rebellion and God forgetfulness, can be likened most strongly to a supernatural gift. Human beings, I suggest, are both natural and supernatural, a hybrid being of the earth and of culture, organic and inorganic, helplessly inward and personal, made by God for God. So we might ask, what is the status and religious stature of the cultural, this realm we human beings now fashion and receive? How should we view the artificial, or to use our more modern terminology, of technology? Just what are we to think of these elaborate constructions, these cityscapes and lit interiors, these roadways joining the land masses of the earth, our machines of every kind, our libraries and writing desks, our clothing, our cooked food and well-aged wines, our medicines and hospitals filled with injured human bodies, the dying and incurable, but also the healers and the healed. What about all these in an age that is now caught up in a world the silicon chip has fashioned, the computer in all its forms that has hollowed out and also built up the familiar patterns of human life, from books and newspapers to schooling and stock trading and the automated regularity of the assembly line, freed of human labor and also predator of those very livelihoods. These forms of the artificial and cultural 
appear to remake what we mean by the natural itself. And in this way, what we mean by the human and the humane. We might well wonder if the Genesis account of our membership in the sixth day has been strained to the breaking point in this sharp incursion of the technological into the very fiber of our being. Think for a moment of the pronounced speculative interest in many circles these days of a non-carbon-based, non-organic human life form. Could we and should we explore the possibility of an entirely artificial body? Is it thinkable and proper to investigate the human person as wetware, as I mentioned in passing above? Could we become a computer in this strong sense that our neurological patterns and perhaps content that's the great mystery, isn't it? Could be replicated in computer software, perhaps hardware too. Could we become robotic or transhuman in this sense? Or in my terms, a holy cultural artifact? Could we in this chilling fashion lift ourselves wholly out of the sixth day of creation, making ourselves a thing no animal or living beast at all. This, of course, seems fantastic, a kind of scientific morality tale. But we might reconsider this cool dismissal of the problem by noticing that technology has already become close to second nature in many human lives. Prosthetic limbs that do not simply fill in the spaces of the arm or leg that was lost, but now moves, picks up a coffee cup or a playing card, or bends at the knee when the wearer wishes to stoop or kneel or sit in a low chair. These are remarkable feats of engineering and of technology, and they give hope to many patients who saw none before. The cochlear implant might be an even more instructive example as the technological implant that is used by the profoundly deaf sends signals to the brain. And the implant in this way becomes naturalized. The artificial has become the natural, all the while remaining artificial. Let me give a final example, one more socially and morally troubling than are any of these medical devices. The widespread practice of plastic surgery among the elites of most industrial nations. So common is the impulse to change our appearance, our nose and eyelids, our waistlines and thighs, our ears, our sagging forearms, that some medical ethicists wonder if we have entered an era in which the endowments of natural birth, our given shape and contour, will no longer govern the human. Some elites, that is, will have bodies that are in themselves artificial and not born. In some such way, the basic discrimin for natural kinds perhaps even species, reproduction and natural birth will seem oddly remote to some human creatures. Now from these examples, we might well wonder whether the hybrid creature that emerged on the sixth day is collapsing under the weight of its own special endowment, its cultural inventiveness. I think these thresholds that we stand before are vital ones, and they raise profound questions for how we Christians are to understand this explosive mix that we inherit from our maker, our inwardness, and our animality. 
It is clear, I think, that the artificial and the cultural are not to be despised. If my account of the Imago Dei has any power, I think it would signal that the invented and the made remain powers and gifts of the gracious creator who raised us up to linguistic inwardness. We are not foreign to the artificial. We are in part at home there. But the natural constraints on human being, on human being are also to be honored. We remain kin to the other living animals on this good earth and our frailties and disease, as well as strength and flourishing, are common to all living things that emerge from the dry ground. We are to honor both, as I see it, and our religious and moral wrestling with the revolutionary power of technology should move within this hybrid world, seeking the Lord's will for a creature fashioned for converse with God. These are complex, delicate problems in a theology of nature and of technology, but they pale, I think, in light of the ever-present total claim of the computer on human life. We can all think of the personal dimension of this problem. Within certain social classes, we human beings look like creatures who have been invaded by an army of square boxes lit from within. We do not cross the street without gazing at them. We do not wait for subways or dry cleaning without scrolling our way across one of these screens. Many do not drive cars, a truly terrible development in a town as crazy for traffic as is Washington, D.C., without reading or sending or rerouting by one of these computer boxes. Everyone knows that restaurants and churches, cemeteries and national parks, playgrounds and street corners are given over to handheld computers and phones. Screens, it is sad to say, seem often far more enticing than the flesh and blood creature sitting across the table from us. Such aberrations in human conversation and intimacy are sure to affect prayer life, our still contemplation of the holy word, and our unquenched thirst for silence that is the music of the human soul. But it may well be that time will teach us how to manage these invaders, to use them as aids and not hail them as masters, and to regulate the time each of us spends with these computers, showing ourselves to be free with them and over them. But another dimension of the computerized life is a far greater threat to humankind than these earlier patterns I mentioned above. And that is the way in which computers have invaded and transformed human work and most especially the human worker. For many tradespeople and for low-level office workers, the workday never ends. They are issued smartphones and are expected to be available whenever they are called. There is no non-working hour. Of course, this has long been true for high-level executives, lawyers, bankers. And it was thought that their pay was to reflect the whole of their life given over to their work. But computers have now made this a relentless demand on ordinary workers and their privacy, the very notion that they would do or say or write something that belonged only to them. That privacy has been eroded by a conviction that monitoring employees is good business. Of course, we are not even touching here on those who do not have work because of computers and the robotics they program and control. 
Computers express and heighten the very idea of efficiency. The news story covered immediately. The stock traded in nanoseconds. The automobile manufactured according to computer-generated patterns across the globe. The service delivered without what we have learned to call the middleman, that is, without the guilds, the mediating institutions, the habits and customs built up in another age and at another pace. Finance capital is a child of the computer. The financial instruments that now impel much of our economic exchange are predicated upon efficient and lightning fast computing and its erasure of old national boundaries. The very contours of poverty and wealth are shaped now by computer technology and we are only now beginning to grasp the revolutionary force of this change. So what should Christians schooled in the doctrine of creation as exemplified in Genesis say about all these developments and corruptions of the human spirit? Of course, I can only give a glimpse, a tentative sketch of how I think faithful Christians might respond, but even a glimpse at times gives some vision for the path ahead. It seems clear to me that we are not to despise technology and the artificial. We too have membership in that realm. We are not to flee it, as if the proper response of Christians to a world in torment is to leave it. But we are rather to bring all things in heaven and on earth into conformity, not only with the image, but also the likeness of Almighty God. We are to find ways that the cultural becomes humane, becomes worthy of the animals elevated in this distinctive way by our Creator. This is a suggestion only, but I believe much exegesis would need to lie behind it to be fully credible. But it seems to me that the relation of the days of creation to the building of cities, to Babel certainly, but also to the holy sites in Genesis, to Shiloh and Shechem, and eventually under the Providencia Day, to the city of the great King David, to the temple fashioned by his son Solomon, and to the house of bread, Bethlehem, that welcomed David's mighty son. This relation gives us the pattern for the proper as well as dangerous joining of nature to culture, human animality to human civilization. It may seem odd indeed to say that the conundrums of computer technology could be addressed by reading intently the Davidic narratives, but that is just what I think. There is a pattern here that established the proper weight of the cultural to the organic, the natural body to the inward soul and the conscience, the creation to the covenant. Neither efficiency nor economic engines properly drive human culture. Only faithful witness to God's ways with us do that. So let us begin together, kin as we are to one another and to the living creatures of this earth, to seek for this pattern and for this justice so that the city of this earth may become in God's good time the city of our God. Thank you very much.